A question for you this morning. Have you ever passionately pursued something? Right? Have you ever passionately pursued something? So I, I, I want you to think about something right, that you've passionately pursued. I'm going to count to three, and I want you to just say it out loud, really loud. So one, two, three. All right, I didn't understand any of that, but we have all pursued something passionately in life, right? You may be pursuing some things passionately right now. And if you are in a passionate pursuit of anything, it requires something. And I want to suggest to you this morning that it requires at least two things, probably more, but I want to suggest to you this morning that it requires your attention and your affection. That if you're going to passionately pursue anything, whatever it might be, it requires your mind's attention and your heart's affection. Whether it's your music, your career path, a relationship, a hobby, anything that you passionately pursue requires your mind's attention and your heart's affection. We're in a journey in the book of Philippians talking about courageous faith and our goal over last week and this week is to develop an undeterred trust in God despite the danger fear and pain that we face. Listen, all of us in our journey of life are going to face danger, fear, pain, hardship, difficulty, doubts. And I want you to have a faith that is courageous, that is able to handle and conquer and face those things. A faith that positions you to fulfill the purposes that God has for you. God has a purpose and a plan for every one of you. He loves you. He created you. He saved you. And He calls you His own and He's given you a life of purpose. And a courageous faith positions us for that, but it also enables us to live for His glory, which is what our full purpose is all about, to bring glory and honor to Jesus. And so that's our goal. And so yesterday we talked about having a genuine relationship with Jesus. And we talked about the fact that in order to have a genuine relationship with Jesus, we cannot trust our pedigree or our performance. That's not a platform that gives us a relationship with God. Paul says, no, it's your position in Christ. Not where you came from, not your denomination, not your church, not your baptism, not any of those things. Not, not your behavior, not your, your morals, not your good works. He says, none of those things our platform for saving faith, but rather it's our position in Christ, which Paul says very clear, it's by faith through grace, by grace through faith, right? That it's, it's God's grace, his, his willingness to give us exactly what we don't deserve when we believe and place our faith and our trust in Him. And so Paul says, it's my position in Christ. Let's just review verse 9. Uh, we were here yesterday. Paul says, I want to be found in Him. My, my spiritual position is in Christ, not having a righteousness that's my own, from the law, not, not from keeping the rules, not from being obedient, not from being religious, but one that's through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. So Paul had a, had a he said, it's my position in Christ that's based on my faith in Christ that gives me right standing with Him. That's my righteousness. My, my right standing does not come from myself, but it's been given to me by God. And this led Paul to a process. Right? It was his position in Christ. He says, this is who God has made me. He saved me. And now there's a process. Right? Now that I've come to Christ, now that I'm in Christ, there's a process of becoming like Christ. And that was the passionate pursuit of Paul's life. And so I want to share with you this morning that, that look at verse 10. He says, my goal, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And we, we looked at this yesterday. He says, that's my aim. That's my goal. That's the pursuit. That's what I'm passionately pursuing. And it was motivated, right? It was motivated by the perfection that awaited him, right? He had a position in Christ, right? He had, he had now a pursuit of Christ, but he was looking forward to perfection with Christ one day. Are you with me? And that was Paul's motivation. Look at verse 11, assuming that somehow I will reach the resurrection from among the dead. Courageous faith requires a passionate pursuit of Jesus. That's what I want you to see this morning, that if you're going to have a courageous faith, that you need to have a passionate pursuit 
of the one who's pursued you and saved you and made you his own. So let's journey on. We're going to look at verses 12 through 21 as best we can this morning. And so let's, let's take a look at God's word together. Paul says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So our faith, our faith in Christ, it's not passive. Look, notice what he says. He says, I haven't already obtained this. He says, my goal, which is to know Christ, right? He says, he says I, I, I'm not arrived. I'm not perfect, right? That word perfect means he hadn't reached the goal. Right? Paul hadn't arrived yet. There was still growth that had to take place. There were still things that God was teaching him. There were still things that God was working in him. And he says, I haven't reached the goal. I'm not perfect. I'm not complete. But he says, I press on. And that word press on means to pursue or to chase or to intensely go after. Right? So it's, a very, it's a very passionate word. He says, I press on. I intensely, I purposely chase after, go after Christ. Paul's attention and affection were centered on knowing Jesus and living for Him and serving Him. Right? His attention, his affection had been changed. Before Paul came to know Christ, his attention and his affection were on himself and his religious performance and his keeping of the law and being zealous and being passionate and even persecuting Christians because he thought that's what God wanted him to do. And Paul's attention was really on himself and his religious performance. But after coming to know Christ, after Jesus saved him, he had a passionate pursuit of knowing Jesus. And his attention and his affection were about knowing Christ. Why? Because Christ had saved him. He belonged to Jesus. I love the hymn that says this. It says, Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he came to redeem. Now I belong to him. Right? Paul didn't know that hymn. It was written a lot later. But I believe if Paul knew it, he would have hummed it and sang it all the time. Right? He says, now I belong to him. And if you're in Christ, if Jesus has saved you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you belong to him. Your life has been purchased by the blood of Christ. You're not your own. You're a new creation in Christ. Old has passed away. The new has come. And we're called to live out that new life. And that was Paul's passion. And he gave it his attention and his affection. Right? His mind's attention and his heart's affection. He pressed on. So look at verse 13. Paul says, I, I do not consider that I've made it on my own. But one thing, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, Paul reiterates, I haven't arrived yet. Right? None of us on our journey of, of knowing Christ, we, none of us have arrived. And even if we talk about a courageous faith, I use that word undeterred. Remember, it means persevering despite the setbacks that we face. And Paul's faith journey wasn't perfect. Neither is yours or neither is mine. And so he says, I haven't arrived, but here's the thing I do. The one thing that I do in my passionate pursuit of Jesus, I forget what is behind and I strain forward to what is ahead. Listen, if we're going to have a courageous faith, there's some things that we have to forget. Paul says, I have to forget what's behind. The surest way to miss out on the purpose that God has for your life is to live in the past. But boy, it is hard sometimes. How many of you would say, sometimes I get stuck in the past? All right? Man, my hand's up too. And a lot of your hands are up. So it's a common issue. And, and sometimes we get stuck on our failures, right? Our mistakes, our shortcomings, right? We, you know, ways that we wanted to live for Jesus, but we failed. Right? How many of you would say, there's a time that I really wanted to be faithful for Jesus. I wanted to be a good witness. I wanted to do something for him. But I fell really short. Just, just be honest. Right? I, I was reminded this morning, I, I believe I mentioned this already in chapel, but I think about Peter, who loved Jesus so much. And the night before the cross, when Jesus says, Peter, i got to warn you, you're going to deny me three times that you even know me. And Peter was like, no, no way, I would never do that. Even if everyone else denies you, I would never do that. And Peter meant it. He meant it with all of his heart. He loved Jesus. But you know the story, that night, Peter failed Jesus greatly. 
Three times he denied that he even knew who he was. But Jesus, what? Forgave him. And he gave him the exact amount of times that Peter had denied him the opportunity to tell him that he loved him. And then he said, feed my sheep. Go serve me. Right? Your past doesn't define you. You failed, but I've restored you. And God used him to preach on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, in the very city where Jesus had been crucified. Peter stood up and boldly proclaimed that Jesus had died but had risen from the dead. And he was the way and the truth and the life. And 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus that day. Your past does not define who you are. The righteousness of God defines who you are. You are in Christ. You are not your mistakes. You are not your failures. You are not the sum total of your sin. And so sometimes we get stuck in our failures. And listen, if we fail, there, there will be sometimes consequences and scars, even as we talked about last week. But God forgives and He heals and He restores and He seeks that which is passed by. And I don't want any of you to get stuck in the past. There's some things you might need to forget today. Right? Because God says He takes our sin and He removes it as far as the east is from the west. And I'm not really good at math and I have no idea how far that is. But it's really far. Right? It's as far as you can get. And so I want you to know if there's stuff in your past, if if you haven't dealt with it if you haven't confessed it then bring it to Jesus he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness but if he's forgiven you then you need to forgive yourself right if Jesus has forgiven you you must forgive yourself and move forward and maybe it's not your failures maybe you're stuck on your success maybe you're maybe you're proud of something and God's calling you to let go of that but you need to forget what's behind then he says you need to strain forward strain forward right because Like I said, in our faith journey, we have setbacks, we have failures, some that we created, some things that happened to us, they weren't our fault. Something shook us, challenged us, caused us to doubt. Paul says you have to leave that in the past, and he says strain forward, like a runner at the end of the race, right? Giving everything that you have towards the finish line. Press on, he says, towards the goal. That's that same word, to pursue, to chase intensely. And he says, we do it for a prize. Right? He, says, he says, all this, we do this for a prize. And he says, here's the prize. The prize is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize is Christ. The prize is Jesus. It is being with him one day. And that was Paul's motivation, right? Because if you're going to leave what's in the past in the past, and if you're going to press on and you're going to passionately pursue something, you need to know it's worth it. You need to know that the pain and the cost is worth it. And Paul says, it's worth it because one day, one day soon, you will see your Savior face to face. And the prize is Christ and seeing Him and knowing Him and living with Him forever and ever. You know, we chase all sorts of earthly prizes, don't we? A couple years ago, uh, we were watching the Super Bowl and uh, there's some people were over and they left and just me watching the game and Laura was actually being productive and it's normally how our, our life goes. She's doing something productive, and I'm watching sports. And uh, afterwards, they were doing the, the Lombardi ceremony, and she came in, and she said, so they got their trophy. I was like, it's a little bit bigger deal than that. But you know, in the big scheme, of, unless, well, when the Eagles won, it was a really big deal. That's a different story. But, but you know, she had a great perspective, right? I, I mean, it's great, and it's wonderful, but it is just a trophy and it won't last it will fade and one day be forgotten but if you're in Christ you're living for a reward you're living for a prize Paul says there there is kept in heaven for you an inheritance it's the upward call of God in Christ Jesus that's the motivation for Paul it was everything was about that moment when he would see his Savior face to face and listen when you're young that can seem so far away But I can promise you, for those of us that are a little further along the journey of life, it goes by so, so quickly. And let that be your motivation. Paul goes on, look at verses 15 and 16. He says, let all of us who are mature, and I'm just going to go ahead and assume that's all of you, okay? I know it's a, a leap. He says, let all of us who are mature think this way. If in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we've obtained. So he says, it's important how we think. 
He says, I want you to agree with me. I want you to think the same way that I think. I want you to have the same. I want your attention and your affection to be what, where my attention and affection are. I want you to have the same passionate pursuit I do. Think this way. And if, if you think differently, uh, you know, he's trusted that God would reveal to you what he had shown him and that you would want what he wanted because you'd experienced what he had experienced. So he says, let's hold true. Let's be steadfast to, to what we've obtained. Let's live the life that, that God's called us to live with our attention and our affection. Not, not just agreeing with Jesus, but obeying Him and pursuing Him and following Him. And Paul knew that in order to do that, we, we need examples. It, 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 in order to, to live out a courageous faith, we, we have to have examples. And in chapter 2 in Philippians, Paul talked about Timothy and Epaphroditus. Right, these two men, one that Paul had traveled with and mentored and, and, and led to faith in Christ, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, I eh, can't say that, uh, Epaphroditus, not enough sleep. He, he was a man from Philippi who came to serve Paul, and he got very sick, and he almost died. And Paul says, look at men like Timothy and Epaphroditus. Look at men like that. Because these are examples of what it looks like to live out a godly life. You know, sometimes we want to look at the, the stars, right? But Paul says, here's some ordinary people that you need to follow. So I want to encourage you. Then Paul says this. He says, join me, brothers, in verse 17, in imitating me. Imitate me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. We need examples, right? We need encouragement. And so I want to encourage you to, to find someone, to find people that you see that are passionately pursuing Christ and follow their example. Now, don't put them on a pedestal. They're human. They're not perfect. Right? D don't worship them. Don't base your faith on them. But look at their example. Paul says, as I follow Christ, I want you to, to follow my example. And so we all need those godly examples. But Jesus, Jesus is our ultimate example. And so ultimately, we look at examples but our eyes, our heart, are focused on Christ. Why? Because even good examples can go bad. Look at verse 18 and 19. He says, For many whom I have often told you, and now even tell you with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Paul says there, there were some people, and we don't know their story, their journey. Maybe they started well. Maybe they began to follow Christ. We don't know, but he says, there's many. He says, I've often told you, and I tell you, even with tears, but Paul was moved with emotion. He says, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory in their, they glory in their shame. Their mind is set on only on earthly things. Right? The belly meant, meant emotions or feelings or desires. He says, there's people that just live according to their feelings. Right? And your feelings are wonderful and they're beautiful. God gave you feelings. He didn't make you a robot. Right? God is a God who has feelings and emotions. But we're not to live by or be ruled by our emotions because our emotions will often lead us the exact opposite of where God wants us. He says they glory, they, they worship, they, they, they take pride in what is shameful. Their mindset's just on the here and now. He says, don't live that way. Don't get caught up in just living for earthly things. Don't get caught up in living for yourself and your pleasure. Paul says, no, I want you to have your, your attention and your affection set on something so much greater. He says, I want you to know who you are. So we look at verses 20 and 21. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. If you are in Christ, if you have come by grace through faith and believed on Jesus as your Savior, you're His child, you're His heir, and you're a citizen not just of the country that you're from on earth, but you're a citizen of heaven, of God's kingdom. And so he says, I want you to live as though that is true. I want you to live right now as though your citizenship is in heaven. And he says, from it we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to transform our lowly body, right? our body that's subject to pain and weakness and decay and frailty and failure. 
He says God's going to transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him to subject all things to Himself. Our resurrection hope is our ultimate hoping. And so that's, that was the motivation that Paul had. He says, I have resurrection hope. And that's what motivates me. Because remember, Paul wrote this letter from prison. right? He wrote it to a church that faced hostility and persecution. The cost of following Jesus was high. And listen, around the world today, the cost of following Jesus in so many places is so much higher than the cost we have. Even today, there will be brothers and sisters of ours who give their lives because they are followers of Jesus Christ. And they will do so because they believe the one who saved them is worthy of everything. And they believe that their hope doesn't lie in this life. They believe their hope lies in resurrection life. They believe the promises of Jesus. And even if we do or do not face that sort of persecution, we still need a courageous faith. And that courageous faith must be anchored in the realities of the hope that we have in Christ. A courageous faith requires a passionate pursuit of Jesus. My heart's desire for you is that God would ignite in your your heart a desire to make Jesus the passionate pursuit of your life, that your attention and your affection would be stuck on Him. So I just want to ask you, what, what has your attention? What has your affection? Like if you were really honest, you'd say, where do I put most of my attention and where does most of my affection lie? What are you pursuing? What are you chasing after? A couple questions. Number one, are you stuck in the past? Listen, if you're stuck in the past, I want you to know if it's, if it's your sin or your shame, your guilt, that Jesus has borne your sin and He has borne your shame and He has carried your guilt and He wants you to find freedom and forgiveness and He wants you to know that your mistakes and your failures and your shortcomings are not final nor fatal. That His grace is greater than all of our sin, all of your sin, all of my sin. And if you need to deal with it, deal with it. But receive His forgiveness and then walk in it, live in it, rejoice in it, live free. Maybe it's success. Maybe maybe it's pride that you need to let go of. Maybe you think, I've got it all together and I'm so great. And God says, no, I'm great and I can be great in you, but you need to let go of that. Number two, what are you pursuing? What are you chasing after? And, and maybe, maybe just think about that a little bit today. Maybe spend some time with the Lord and just say, what really am I pursuing? And then number three, are you willing to strain forward? Right, Paul says, I strain forward like, like a runner at the end of the race. I lean into following Jesus with everything that I am, with everything that I have. Right, Paul was a passionate guy. And his passion, once he knew Jesus, was all about him about knowing Him. He says, it's my aim to know Him. So one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to what's ahead, I strain for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. May that be our story, your story, and my story. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this day that You've made. I thank You for Your Word that's living and powerful and true. And Father, I just pray for each person here today, including myself, Because, Father, I know so many times my attention and my affection gets pulled away from you and from pursuing you the way I ought to. And so, Father, I pray that you might do a work in every heart, including mine today, that you might help me and help everyone here today to see the worth and the value of knowing you, of pursuing you. And, Father, I pray that we would give our attention and our affection fully to you and passionately pursue that which you saved us for. And Father, I pray that as we do that, our eyes would be on you, our ultimate example, and that our our motivation would be in the upward call of God in Christ, that one day we will be with you. And Father, may we look forward to that day with anticipation, even as we live here and serve you and fulfill the purposes you've made us for. In Jesus' name, amen.